What's going on, folks? I'm Pastor Hassan. I'm the senior pastor of Thistletown Baptist Church in Rexdale in the West End of Toronto. And it's a real pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I realize that there's probably a lot of other things you could be doing. You could be sleeping for all I know, um, but you chose to um, join in with us and hear God's word. And my hope for everybody who's listening is that as we open up God's word together, uh, that, that God would actually open us up to his word, that, that we would not just hear the word, that we wouldn't just think about it, but that we would actually be changed by the word of God, that the Holy Spirit would work to bring conviction and, and real transformation in the hearts of those of us who hear. So yeah, that's, that's my hope, and, and I'm really excited about that. We're in the book of 1 Corinthians. We have been for some time now. And this morning, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So I hope you got a Bible. Um, if, you, if you don't have one, you're going to want to grab one and uh, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're continuing this conversation or this discussion that Paul is having with the Corinthian church about idols and idolatry. The Corinthians lived in a culture that wasn't all that different from ours in the sense that people worshiped all kinds of things. Like there, there were all kinds of, of so-called gods. And, and see, for a lot of us, the way things work nowadays, the idols and the idolatry of our culture, it might not be as blatant as people bowing down and, and, and making sacrifices to statues, but don't fool yourself. It, it's, it's no less prevalent. It's no less a, a reality for us. We think that we're more sophisticated than, than all of that, but, but the truth of the matter is it's, it's just in the way that we're built by, by nature. People will find something to worship, something that we see as as ultimate, something that we devote our time and our energy and, and our entire lives to. And, and so for people who belong to Jesus, we have to learn how to live in a world that, that's full of idols and idolatry. We have to learn to do that in such a way that we're not disconnected from the world. So we're still engaging with people. We're still interacting with the folks around us, but, but we're, we're distinct. We're, we're called to live differently. And, and the reason that we're called to live differently is because God, by his grace, has made us different. He, he's made us saints. And it takes wisdom to, to figure out, okay, how, what does it look like to live as a saint in this culture? It takes wisdom to know how I should live, what sorts of things I should do and, and shouldn't do as a Christian. Now, don't get me wrong that there are certain things that, that are pretty black and white. As a Christian, I should do this and, and I shouldn't do that. But there's lots of other areas where you don't have a, an explicit command in Scripture. You have principles and, and you have to sort of figure out, okay, the Bible doesn't directly address this situation, but, but how should I live? What's the best thing for me to do in order to bring glory and honor to God? So there's some areas that aren't as, as clear, aren't as black and white. And the Corinthians find themselves dealing with one of those particular issues, eating food, sacrifice to idols. Should they do it? Or not? That's sort of the, the question that starts off this whole conversation. And, and instead of just telling them yes or no, what Paul does is he begins to engage the Corinthians in this discussion of how they use their rights and freedoms as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And what he does in chapter 8, the previous chapter, is he basically says to them, love should lead you to give up your rights for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And now again, he's going to challenge them to, to rethink their rights and, and how they use them. 
And so we want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 14. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 to 14, in the sermon that I want to call Rethinking Our Rights. So let me get a drink of water and we'll pray. And then we'll jump right in. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this occasion that we get to look to your word and what, what a privilege it is even to just realize that you have, you have chosen to speak to us through your word and you, you've chosen to speak most clearly and definitively through the person of your son who uh, John chapter 1 calls the word who became flesh and dwelt among us and we thank you Lord for not remaining hidden. We thank you Lord for not leaving us to just sort of figure out life and how we ought to live as if we could figure out those things on our own. Um, on our own, we would be um, lost, um, not just in this life, but for all of eternity. And so thank you for revealing yourself to us. And we pray that as, as we look to your word now, you would speak to each one of our hearts, um, that you would bring comfort, encouragement, uh, correction, everything that's necessary for, for every individual that's, that's listening. Only a, a sovereign, omnipotent God, such as yourself, could do that. And so you're a big God, and so we come to you asking for big things. And we, we ask that you would do all of it for your honor and glory, so that each one of us would walk away rejoicing in you, more amazed at you, and so that your fame would, would spread to the ends of the earth. So give me grace, help me to speak carefully and clearly, and may it be a demonstration of the Spirit's power. In Jesus' name, amen. If you had to come up with a top five list of the most important things in your life, what would they be? Or maybe five is not enough if you want to do a top ten list. What would be some of the most important things in your life. I did a quick search online because we all know how reliable the internet is. And I just pulled up a couple of websites and, and one of them, um, here's what one of them said. It basically suggested that no matter who you are, the most important things in your life, the things that should make your list should include at least this much, your family, your friends, and your health. I think it, it was in the order of health, family, and then friends. And then on this particular list, love came in at number four. Then I was kind of doing a little bit more hunting around, and I found this quote from famous uh, New York Yankees catcher Yogi Berra. And Yogi Berra put love at the top spot. And he said this, and I quote, Love is the most important thing in the world, but baseball is pretty good too. And so all of us have different things that are important to us in life. And, and, and I think it's fair to say that for most of us, somewhere on that list, we're going to have rights and, and freedoms. For us to have certain rights and freedoms, that, that ranks somewhere on our list of things that are important. And what Paul does in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 to 14, is he lets us know that if you're a Christian, there's something that's more important than your rights, as, as important as they are. What, what Paul presses home in these first 14 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is, is this, that the advancement of the gospel, if you're a Christian, the advancement of the gospel is more important than you and your rights. The advancement of the gospel is more important than you and your rights. And so I want to show you that from, from the text. The way 1 Corinthians chapter 9 starts out is like Paul is playing a game of 21 questions. He asks a whole lot of questions in these first 14 verses. And he does that because he wants the Corinthians to know something about his life and and not in a self-serving way he wants them to think about his life and and how he uses his rights and so what he does from the beginning is, is paul asserts his rights 
That's our first point. Paul asserts his rights in verses 1 to 7. Notice the first two verses. Paul says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. And so Paul very confidently starts talking about his rights. Like you want to talk about rights and, and the freedom to do certain things? I have rights as an apostle of Jesus Christ, Paul says. And see, with all of these questions that Paul is, is asking, he's expecting a positive answer. Am I not free? Of course I am. Am I not an apostle? Definitely. Like, have I not seen Jesus, our Lord? You better believe it. Paul says, I'm, I'm as free as they come. I'm, I'm not a slave to anybody or anything but Jesus. I'm, I'm serving him. I work for him. I'm on mission for him. I've seen Jesus. Can you imagine talking to Paul and, and bragging about famous people that you've met? Like, oh, I went to such and such a concert one time, and I, I got to go backstage and meet whoever. I got so-and-so's autograph. And Paul's just like, well, I've met Jesus. Like on some VIP type stuff too. Like the resurrected King Jesus showed up to me, knocked me off my horse. It, it was the most terrifying thing and the most glorifying or, or glorious thing I've ever experienced in my entire life. And you just be like, oh, like, what do you say to that? Like, you, you can't, you just walk away. And Paul is reminding the Corinthians that he is an apostle. And they are the proof of that. He says, if, if, if nobody else recognizes me as an apostle, you should. Y'all know. Like, the very fact that you exist as a church is evidence of my apostleship, you, that, that I'm not some knockoff apostle. See, the Corinthian church was, was proof of the Holy Spirit's work through Paul's ministry. Because remember, Paul is the one who brought the gospel to the Corinthians. And, and, and in saying all of this stuff that he's saying in these first two verses, Paul is not bragging. He, he's trying to help the Corinthians see that he practices what he preaches. So he's not just coming to them saying, love should make you give up your rights. He's saying, that, that's what I do. Look, look at my life. Look at my example. Notice verse 3. Paul says, this is my defense to those who would examine me. So it seems like there were some people who were calling into question whether or not Paul was a, a legit apostle. But, but the Corinthians, they, they should know. Paul was appointed by Jesus as an apostle. And they should know that as an apostle, Paul has certain rights. He has certain demands even that he could make in his ministry. He, he could expect certain things. Now, having said that, I feel like I need to, to just pause for just a second and address young men who are maybe considering going into ministry. Let, let me just give you some advice as somebody who's been where you are. If you're thinking about going into ministry and your attitude is, all right, how can I make this work for me? Like, like what, what's in this for me? What can I get out of it? Like, what, what are we talking in terms of perks and benefits? Like, at the very least, you're thinking about ministry totally wrong, the, the complete wrong way. Or worse, you might think you're called to ministry, but, but you're really not. See, that, that kind of self-serving attitude has no place in Christian ministry or in the Christian life, period. That, that, that's the exact opposite of what Paul is talking about. Check out what he says in verses 4 and 5. He says, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right 
to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and, and Cephas. Paul says, I can eat or drink whatever I want. And in and, and saying that, he's, he's picking up on the, the food issue from chapter 8. But he also wants to make the point that he has the right to receive support from the Corinthian church. He has the right to be supported by them in his ministry as an apostle. He said, hey, I, I have the right to be taken care of. I, I have the right to bring along, if he were married, a, a believing wife and, and for you to, to support us like, like the other apostles. Paul is suggesting that he has the right to have the Corinthians provide for his financial and, and material needs. And we're talking just basic necessities here. Paul is not making demands like you need to roll out the red carpet and where's my apostle's parking space and my, my fancy chariot to put in that space and I need a, a house and a vacation house. That Paul is not doing that. He's not looking to increase his luxury. No, the goal in, in Paul being supported as an apostle in his ministry is so that it would, it would free him up to, to give himself fully to the work of preaching the gospel. Verse 6 says, For is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? So, so Paul and Barnabas didn't just preach the gospel. like They had jobs on the side. And in fact, they, they worked hard night and day. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, it says, We didn't eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. That's how Paul operated. And, and he says it was not because we do not have that right, like as, as apostles, we have the right to, to expect support from the people that we're ministering to and, and serving. But he says to, to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. He says we, we have the right to be supported in what we're doing. And, and that's just common sense at one level. Like Paul says in verse 7, pretty much, he says, you, you work hard, you should get something for the hard work that you do. Who, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Like, like the military doesn't say to you, hey, come serve with us, but, but you got to find some kind of way. You got to find somewhere to live. You got to find some kind of way to provide food for yourself. No, they, they pay for those things. Paul goes on to say, who, who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? And I mean, e even kids understand this. Like, like Benaiah, my son, he, he'll be four next month. And sometimes when Kathy is, is baking something, like she'll have Benaiah come help. She'll give him a job. So if she's making apple crisps. Like she would chop up some apples or whatever and have him put those apples in, in a bowl so she can mix it up with the nutmeg and the cinnamon and make it proper. And, 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 and he's, he's good like that. But, but for every piece of chopped up apple that he puts in that bowl, he's going to put two or three of them in his mouth. Like that's, that's, he, he, he gets it. Like if, if I'm going to do work, I ought to benefit from the work that I'm doing. Even when he's not working, he's got his hands, little hands in the bowl, right? But, but Paul is driving home this, this point that there ought to be some kind of benefit from your labor. And so that, that's where Paul starts. He, he starts by asserting his rights, but not in the sense that he's like bullying people around or, or how can I use this to advance myself? He's not tearing people down with his rights. He's just building the case that there, there's something more important than him and his rights. But, but first, what he does before he gets there is he shows us that the scriptures actually support his right. So Paul doesn't just assert his rights. Point number two is that the scriptures support Paul's rights. So, so this idea that 
If you work hard, you ought to reap some kind of benefit from your hard work. That's not just some generic man-made principle. Like It's in God's word. Look at verse 8 and 9. Paul says, Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? And then he quotes Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. And so what farmers would do and still do in a lot of places in the world is they would take a a big animal like an ox or, or a cow and you'd have this big animal walk around on a big pile of grain. And they would do that for the purpose of separating out the good part, so the kernel, the edible part, from from the chaff, the part that you just kind of throw away. I I sent around a video of of a a farmer in Ethiopia treading the grain. So he had these these cows like yoked together and they're walking around on on this pile of grain. And what what are they doing as they're walking around treading the grain? Nom, 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 nom. They're, they're, They're eating. And and that's biblical. Deuteronomy 25 verse 4 says, do not muzzle the ox when he's treading the grain. When he's doing that, let him eat. Like he, he, He should benefit from his hard work. Don't make him work for nothing. And just at a base level, that's kind of neat to see God's care even for animals. And, and we see that even with, with Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, Jesus says not a single sparrow, not one tiny little bird falls to the ground apart from God without his permission. So God cares about animals, but his care and concern for animals is, is nowhere even close to how much he cares for people made in his image. Like we, we, are the crown of God's creation. Nothing else in all of creation is made like us in his image. And because of that, we have incredible worth and value and and dignity. And and so God is concerned about us. God so loved the world, people, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is concerned about people and what what we need and what we need most is a savior. We we need somebody to to live perfectly the way we never could. And, And we need somebody to die in our place for all of the ways that we failed to honor God. And and there's only one somebody, one, someone who fits that description. It's Jesus. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, it says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's good news right there. Because I don't care who you are or, or how good of a person you think you are, whether You realize it or not, you you are a sinner. You, you, by nature, stand condemned before a holy and righteous God. And and, and you need a Savior. And, and, And the best thing in the world for you to do is to realize that God has sent one. God has sent his Son, and he is the only Savior. The best thing in the world for you to do is to realize that and trust in him. Trust Jesus. Turn from your sin and put your faith in him. So now you don't have to spend your whole life separated from God. You don't have to spend your whole life and all of eternity, for that matter, separated from God. You can be forgiven and you can be reconciled to him. Like I couldn't I couldn't rush past these verses without letting somebody know that. But notice what Paul says at the end of verse nine. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Verse 10, does he not certainly speak for our sake? 
In other words, Deuteronomy 25 verse 4 about muzzling oxes, oxen is not ultimately about the ox. It, it's about God's concern for people. It, it was written for our sake, verse 10 says, because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. This is about God's concern for people. It, it's, it's this divine principle that God has laid out in his word so that we know the person who works ought to reap benefits from their work. And that applies even in, in ministry. Check what Paul says in verses 11 and 12. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we not even more? So Paul says, we, we worked hard. Like we, we brought you the gospel. We, we worked to help you grow spiritually. Like, is it unreasonable, given what we've done, for us to, to receive some sort of material, financial support from you? Like, you, you supported other people. Paul probably has in mind guys like Apollos and others who, who also worked with the Corinthians, but he says, hey, me and my guys, like, I, I should be the first in line. And, and, and not just because, hey, I'm, I'm an apostle, and, and not just because of the authority of the scriptures, like, it's, it's, it's well, let me back up. It, it, it's not just because I'm an apostle, but because based on the authority of the scripture, I should be first in line. I have the right to be supported here. And, but this is not Paul saying, hey, I'm an apostle, I have rights, I have the Bible backing me up, therefore I, I demand to be paid. No. Paul has a legitimate right, and he's using Scripture in a legitimate way, but he's not insisting on his own right. You ever have somebody try to use the Bible to justify something? Not because they're like, oh, I really want to please God, but because it was just something they wanted to do. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people trying to justify smoking weed. They ain't been more been to church, care nothing about Jesus and the Bible, but they know that one verse from Genesis 1. Like, I've given every herb bearing seed that is upon you, every herb bearing seed that is upon the earth. All of a sudden, they start speaking King James English and all that. Like, see, the Bible says I can smoke weed. But, but that's an illegitimate use of the scripture. Just going to the, like, cherry-picking verses to try to make them say what you want them to say and try to co-sign how you want to live. And so it's helpful, but before we move on to the last point here, to think about that personally. Like, do you do that with the Bible? Do you come to the Bible just looking for verses that you can twist up to make it seem like they, they justify how you want to live? Or is your posture towards the Bible the, the correct posture, and you come to the Scriptures looking for the Scriptures to, to correct you and, and conform the way that you live so that it matches what God wants. Like that, that's the right way to do it. And, and even with, with legit rights and freedoms that we have as Christians. So like if you look at the Bible and the Bible, the Bible, there's no, um, no prohibitions against this. There's no, no, no principles that would, that would dictate that I shouldn't do that. Or you have some clear teaching in the scripture that says this is okay. How do you use your freedoms even then? Like, do you see those rights and those freedoms as, as something that, that exists first and foremost for you? Or do you see them as things that exist first and foremost for the glory of God and for the good of those around you? What Paul is going to show us in these last couple of verses is what he does with even a, a legit right that he has as an apostle. In verses 12 to 14, Paul gives up his rights for the advancement of the gospel. So Paul asserts his rights, and we see that 
The scripture supports Paul's rights, but ultimately Paul gives up his rights for the advancement of the gospel. Instead of holding on to his rights for dear life, Paul is willing to let them go. And, and that's the way it should be. Like as, as Christians, we ought to hold on to our rights like parents should hold on to their kids. Think about how, how you think about parenting. Like if you hold on to your kids so tightly and you're, you're overbearing, you, you, can, you can stifle your kids. And, and understandably, like they're not meant to be raised that way. But understandably, as a parent, you, you want to, to protect your kids. You want to hold on to them. But the way we ought to parent, says the, the young guy who, who hasn't been a parent for very long, is, is we ought to parent realizing that ultimately my, my kids aren't mine. Like these kids don't ultimately belong to me. I'm going to be a good steward of my responsibility as their father to raise them in the fear and instruction of the Lord. And I'm going to do that by the grace of God, but I'm going to do all of that knowing that I got to be willing to let them go. Like I can't, I can't hold on to them for, for dear life as if, as if they ultimately belong to me. And the same thing is true of our rights. Like we want to be good stewards of the rights and the freedoms that we have as Christians, but we got to be willing to let them go. Listen to what Paul says in the second half of verse 12. He has a rightful claim to receive financial support, material support from the Corinthians. Nevertheless, he says, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. He says that he and, and, and Barnabas and the other people working with him, they would put up with anything to keep from making it hard for the gospel to advance. So at the drop of a hat, if, if Paul needed to, he would gladly lay down his rights for his brothers and sisters in Christ and for the sake of the advance of the gospel. So, so for Paul, having people hear and, and believe and grow in the gospel, like that was way more important than, than him and, and his individual rights. Can you say that? Is that true for you? Can, can I say that? Like, how, how do I use my rights? Would I be willing to give up legit rights that I have or, or some right that I think I have? Would I be willing to give that up in order to see the good news of Jesus Christ spread? Would I be willing to give those things up because I believe that the spread of the gospel is more important than my rights? And think about it. How would, would Paul receiving financial support from the Corinthians put an obstacle in the way of the gospel? Well, in order to understand that, you got to understand a little bit of how Corinth worked. And so the way Corinth was, like everybody was selling something. Like you had all kinds of speakers going around teaching this and that, and they did it for money. And, and Paul wants to separate himself from that. He, he, he wanted people to see that there was something different, not just about him, but about his message, about the gospel. Like you had all of these public speakers, and what they, what they were saying was garbage, but, but it sounded good. And then along comes Paul, and he wasn't impressive at all as a public speaker, but his content, though, the gospel. It's, it's, it's foolishness to the world, but, but it's the power and the wisdom of God. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And so Paul's message and his methods were different. He, he wasn't out there trying to get paid. He was out there trying to see people saved. And he wanted to see people not just be saved, but to see people grow in the gospel. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the greatest news ever. But the crazy thing is, the way our hearts are wired naturally is that we reject that. 
Like that's the default position of the human heart. When we hear Christ died for our sins and was raised, the immediate response of our hearts naturally is, is I don't want that. I, I don't like that. I, I, don't, I don't need it. But, but you better believe that there's no obstacle in the universe that can keep God from saving whoever it is that he decides he wants to save. Like if, if, if you're a Christian, you, you are proof of that. If you're a Christian, it's, it's not because, oh, you were just a better person than your neighbor or you somehow figured out how to get to God. No, if you're a Christian, it's because God Almighty broke through the barriers and the obstacles in your heart towards the gospel. It's because God, when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, made you alive together with Jesus. That's the only reason. And yet, even though Paul realizes that nothing can stop God from saving who he wants to save, it's no problem for God to overcome any obstacle that is in the way of people believing the gospel, Paul's attitude still was, I'm not going to put any unnecessary barriers in the way. That, that was his attitude. So if that means I got I to gotta give up my rights as an apostle, that's easy. I'm doing it all day long. The advancement of the gospel is way more important than me and my rights. You see, brothers and sisters, our call as Christians is to live in a way that, that, that the, in such a way that the message that we proclaim and the way that we use our rights honors God. And it makes the world around us wonder, like, who are these people like, who give up their rights like that? Because nobody, nobody's doing that. The way the world works, people are too busy serving themselves. And even when people do serve you, it, it tends to be when, when it's convenient for them. Like if it, if it kind of serves me in some sort of way, then yes, I'll serve you. But the MO of the Christian, the way that we are called to operate is that we're, we're to be willing and, and, and more than ready to lay down our rights, give up our rights in order to serve other people and to see the work of the gospel advance. And here's some ways, just real, real quick, some practical ways that that might look. As a Christian, you might give up taking a nice vacation that you worked hard to save up for. And instead of doing that, you take that money and you give it to support missions. You give it to serve, to support the work of the gospel among the nations. Now, do you have the freedom to go on a vacation? Of course, go on a vacation. No, no, no guilt trip anywhere. Go on a vacation to the glory of God. But you also might want to rethink how you use your rights and, and, and give for the sake of the gospel. Or if you're a member of Thistletown Baptist Church, what it might look like for you is giving of some of your time during the week. Take an hour or two and, and come help whenever all this social distancing stuff is over. Come help tutor kids with Urban Promise. Come spend some time helping some of these kids learn reading and, and math. And you'd be surprised when you do that how often you have opportunities to talk about Jesus. Like, do you want to see the gospel of Jesus Christ spread? And are you willing to give up your rights in order to see that happen? But that's something that all of us need to consider. That's what Paul is driving home. He ends the section with these words in verses 13 to 14. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. He's just driving home the same point. He points out how 
in the old covenant, the, the, the priests would, they were allowed to eat certain parts of the different sacrifices that they made. And, and then he goes on as if that wasn't enough to say that Jesus actually commanded that people who preach the gospel ought to get their living by the gospel. So again, Paul's like, here's this legit right that I have as an apostle, as a minister of the gospel, but he doesn't make use of this right. And he says what he does in verse 13 and 14 because he wants the Corinthians to see that his example has implications for how they're handling their situation, how they're handling this whole issue of meat or food sacrificed to idols. He wants them to think about how what they're doing impacts people around them and impacts the work of the gospel. And so, brothers and sisters, it's worth us considering, like, what, what, what's more important to us? What's more important to you? Like, you being able to do whatever you want, you having certain rights and freedom, or the advance of the gospel? Are, are, you, are there things in your life that you are unwilling to let go? Is there anything in your life that you are unwilling to, to let go of in order to see people come to know the one who gave up everything for you. Brothers and sisters, it just might be time for us to rethink our rights. And to do that ultimately for the glory of God, to do that so that we could see the gospel spread in, in our communities and in our city, in this nation, and across the whole globe. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that we belong to a Savior who gave up his rights in order to serve us. Thank you that we belong to a Savior who willingly gave up his rights so that he might give his life as a sacrifice for sinners. And we thank you for the transformation that that reality brings for all those who trust in Christ. Um, every single one of us is a new creation. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to live in light of that. That we would be more than willing and, and, and ready to lay down our lives and lay down our rights for the sake of the gospel. Make that true. Uh, here in Toronto, make that true all across Canada and all across the world. We pray that you would do that for your own namesake. And we pray these things in our matchless Savior's name, Jesus. Amen. All right. God bless y'all. Take care.